Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the Advocacy and Water Protection in Native California Speaker Series and Certification Program. Today I'm coming from you to, on your, from Yurok land. I want to dedicate this youth advocacy webinar to someone who is a very special youth advocate and advocate for the Klamath River who passed away last week. So this webinar is dedicated to Grant Gilkinson from um, Nature Rights Council and formerly from the Karuk tribe. We love you very much, Grant, and we will miss you. This is the last webinar in the series. Please remember to fill out your evaluation forms if you are part of the certificate program. And we wanna remind you to make sure to turn in any proposals to present at the Water Advocacy in Native California Symposium on September 25th. Due to fires and other recent events, um, proposals to present are now due on September 2nd instead of today. More information will be on our website and we will drop the link in the chat. We also wanted to announce that we, we will be doing a week of action for California water justice in September. There are five steps that will be part of this week of action webinar series and Every webinar, we will take action for water justice in California. So please mark your calendars. The week will focus on action and each of the hour long workshops will include direct actions and to make sure on water justice issues. On September 14th, we will be talking about dismantling environmental racism. On September 15th, we will talk about learning where your water comes from and taking action for headwaters. On September 16th, we will talk about the fight for clean water, clean drinking water in California. And on September 17th, we will talk about halting water privatization in California. On September 18th, we will be talking about undamming the Klamath River. So those are the five steps we will be taking. So please make sure to, um, we, will drop the, we will drop the link to register in the chat here today. Um, and with that, I'm very excited to present today's panel. Over, all over the country and all over the world, we are watching protests for Black Lives Matter to defund the police and to stop youth incarceration. And we're also in our watersheds watching as youth take charge and are the ones who are um, making sure that we have clean water and salmon for the future. So um, whether the protests are to end environmental racism, to pro promote environmental justice, um, to promote equality for all people in Black Lives Matter, we are seeing the youth take charge. And so I really feel like it's super important and exciting to have so many of the youth with us today. With that, um, I would like to start with this uh, really short presentation and um, a couple of videos. So I am gonna share my screen. <clears throat> Sorry about that. For some reason, it was starting really late in the slides. Um, but at Save California Salmon, we really believe in working with the youth. Like I said, I've been seeing over and over again that youth from whether it's Undam the Klamath that I've been working with for the last um, 18 years, or any other campaign or movement I've worked with, it's always the young people that are really taking charge. And we're really excited to be able to work with the Hoopa High School water protectors who are gonna be speaking today. Um, and also um, the Klamath Tribes Youth Council and the Krug Tribes Youth Council. Um, these are really amazing young people. Um, so I wanna remind people that this is Water Action August. And um, it's really important that you take action to save our rivers. As part of this webinar today, we're going to drop several links into the chat and um, we're hoping that you can sign petitions, that you can write letters, and you can do everything you can to help us. Um, along with um, leading the way on the Klamath River to undam the Klamath, um, youth have really been leading the way to bring back some of the really important things to people on the river. And this is a picture of the Klamath Salmon Run, which we were unable to do this year because of COVID-19. 
but this was started by Hoopa High School students. Um, I think it must be 14 years ago now or something like that. I um, mean, and, and they run all the way from the mouth of the Klamath River to the Klamath Dams most years, and also through through Hoopa. And we see a lot of young people running. My son's been running in this since he's been able to walk. And I know a lot of other young people also participate in this. Um, this is also the Salmon Run. And this is our local baseball team um, in the Salmon Run. And they're running behind um, some traditional canoes, which Sammy will probably talk about a little when he speaks. Um, this is a youth camp on the Klamath River, which um, was co-hosted and um, held by Grant Gilkinson, who I mentioned earlier, from the Nature Rights Council. Um, and it's really important that when we work with youth, we also make sure to work with elders and we teach each other often about how we go about not only protecting water, but also respecting the river and um, the struggles that people have gone through to even be able to fish um, and do ceremonies and things of that nature. So it's uh, really exciting that not only do we do, um, at least on the Klamath River and a lot of other areas, work on youth activism, but also making sure that there's intergenerational activism. And um, it's always really amazing to me how much the youth respect the elders and really do want to hear the stories. So um, it's, yeah, it's just really important to reach out and to do everything that we can to make sure that we can all get together as communities and work together to fight for our rivers and for each other. Um, this is a picture of Tegin Albers, um, Grant Gibkinson's son, um, and he is filleting fish. Um, and that's actually the chairman of the Yurok tribe behind him. Um, and uh, it, yeah, so not only do we think it's really important to share with each other these skills um, about water protection, but also to share like, well, how do people make sure to um, learn the skills that they'll need in order to become men someday? And um, Tegin is actually becoming an amazing fisherman and amazing advocate for the river. And this is him at the youth camp last year. <laughs> and this is Connect Neck Lowry and um, some of his family and um, also the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club that are presenting today. And one of the things that's really amazing about um, the youth advocates that we work with also is that not only are they really smart and inspiring young people, but they're extremely effective. This is a Humboldt County Board of Supervisors meeting where um, the youth actually brought a resolution to the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors to um, drop their support for building the site's reservoir project, which will impact the Trinity River flows, which means that there is not wa cold water to make sure there's not Klamath fish kills. Um, and they got um, a resolution from the Humboldt County supervisors that was unanimous to support the use resolution that they were bringing in front of the board. Um, so, and I think the next one, this one is um, a picture from the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club in Reading. And they actually went down, to Danielle, who's gonna speak, um, and the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club went down to Sacramento and they demanded that there be a hearing within their community on the Delta Tunnels because it's going to affect uh, Northern California's water supply in the Trini River. So um, they did a school field trip where they went all the way down to Sacramento and they talked to the um, California Water Resources Department and they said, we need a hearing within our communities. There's no reason we should have to drive five hours to testify on how important our water is to us. And they got that hearing. And a lot of people were really shocked because the governor, Governor Newsom did not want to give a hearing to Northern California people on the impacts of diverting more water from our rivers. So um, I'm extremely proud of the youth that are gonna be presenting here today because some of them are as young as 11 and they've done so much amazing work and are, have been extremely effective in their work. Um, and that's the end of the uh, little introduction, but we do also have a video or two videos that we're gonna share. They're just a minute long. Um, but they really explain what the youth are doing in the rivers. And um, we did make these with uh, the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club and with the help of Ancestral Guard. And they're both pr presenting here after I'm done. Governor, do you know my friend? Don't take our water from the tunnel. The river is our livelihood. We depend on it for everything. It's who we are. It's our way of life. And we're asking you, Governor Gavin Newsom, to not take our river, not take who we are from us. Once this water is gone, it will tear our families apart. It will no longer allow us to partake in our ceremonies, nor our traditions. 
when you take our water and you take our rivers, you're taking away our way of life. Without it, we don't know who we are. We don't know what to do. We don't know where we come from. We need it. These voluntary agreements that are being forced upon our people are based off the wants and the needs of corporations that are extracting one of the most precious resources that California has to offer our people. And on what price? We're going to remember if you stood up for us. We're going to remember if you heard us. We're going to remember if you fought for us. It's time to come together. You can do it. Uh, sorry about that. I'm having trouble um, finding the next video. Uh, so I guess we will just skip it. Um, so I would like to introduce Sammy Genstall from Ancestral Guard, who is is presenting with us here today. And um, Sammy and I actually just came from off of the Klamath River. Um, and um, yeah, he is a board member of Save California Salmon, and he is the director of Ancestral Guard. And I've been working and a lot of people in this community have been working with Sammy since he was 16 years old in the fight to undam the Klamath River. Hello, I agree. Nick now, Sammy Jinsaw. I come from the village of Rekwa. And uh, thanks for the introduction, Regina. Um, I've been involved with Undam the Klamath campaign since I was 16. And one thing that we did today is we came together to stop people from Pacific Corps and leaders from tribes from coming up the river, going up to have a meeting at Blue Creek. And the reason why we did this is because we believe that the power comes from the people, the council or these leaderships of a lot of any organization, the power doesn't come from them. The people give power to our leaders to help make those decisions. So what we want to be known is that Pacific Corps needs to speak and be reliable for the people and the lives that their dams are ruining. And we came together, it was a really awesome time. Um, they got the message and we have still have people down there to see what the results of what that meeting is gonna be. So it's, uh, it's pretty awesome, thankful to be here. One thing I'd like to say is that through youth organizing, one of my first experiences was actually in the sixth grade and it was, there's a court case, Jensaw versus Delmar County. Um, at school uh, education board. And with that court case, it was about how Delmar County had to cut budgets. So what they decided, instead of cutting budgets in schools in Crescent City, they were gonna go to the reservation, even though it cost more money to close that school because it was on the reservation and didn't affect any of the schools in town. And so that first piece of, um, of systematic oppression is what really fueled us and our families to stand up and it's these experiences that we as adults because i'm aged out of youth organizing now i'm 25 years old and, uh, and now i'm happy to serve on the Yurok tribes um, natural resources committee as the vice chairman and be able to help in any ways that i can one of the things that we're doing is we've decided that what is the next step in the revolution how are we going to help our people and the answer to that is food sovereignty and making sure that our people are healthy and have access to healthy opportunities throughout life. So these youth, so we're starting a zero to three program so we can work with those kids. And as they mature and develop and become who they are and start to offer their gift to the world, that they have a strong foundation. And that's really what the best thing we can do as parents is not hide, um, not hide what's wrong with the world from our children, but talk to them about it and find ways they have the answers they have the solutions we just have to be able to listen and work together and offer that guidance for this next generation to be able to solve the problems that's going to be facing them for much longer it's going to be facing us great sammy and do you want to introduce connect neck yep connect and then coming up next we got connect neck really awesome young man who's doing some good work for the river and his people Thank you, Sammy. Before I begin, I want to say that what I'm doing, I'm about to say, to say something about how the dams are affecting the earth, not just the people in the area that I'm in, but all over Northern California. This can be done by anyone, and it just goes to show how much people 
can do if they just put their mind and body to it and that they can believe in themselves. So, I aqui, neck now connect neck, which means, hello, my name is connect neck. I'm from the earth. My blood comes from Northern California, Germany, and Ireland. A lot of Northern California indigenous people depend on salmon for food and other spiritual and physical purposes. The dams and water diversion caused the 2002 fish kill. This emotionally affects my dad, which emotionally affects me. I get extremely mad knowing that water diversion is hurting my family and my community. Before rivers were dammed, they were free, full of water, and they were healthy. They had nutrients, tons of fish, and indigenous humans respected and honored the will, desire, and purpose of the river to provide a place where relationships can be healthy and balanced. But now that the rivers are dammed, they're wrongfully imprisoned, have less water, and they're unhealthy. Rivers have less nutrients, not nearly as many fish, and some European immigrants have tried to crush the will, desire, and purpose of the rivers. I demand that corporations let go of the flow and restore the indigenous sustainable relationship within, with the river. Watch loud, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Danielle. Take it away, Danielle. Okay, um, start video. Is it good? Okay. Hey, young Mamalio, we do Danielle Holiet, we do Hosako not Holiet, Frank Wahonta thing, Hoan cut chink sukh die, McConnell or um, McConnell, sorry, McConnell Wahonta. McConnell will hunt that thing, Frank will hunt that thing, Kogrov will hunt that thing, Jackson will hunt that thing. Hello, friends. My name is Danielle. I'm a member of the Hoopa Valley tribe. I live near the village of Hoanka on the Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation. My family names are McConnell, Jackson, Frank, and Kogrov. Um, I'm going to do a presentation today prepared by some of the water, Hoopa Valley High School water rights activists. Um, are you going to put it up on the screen, Regina? Okay. So this was prepared by Kylie Sorrell of the Hoopa Valley High School Water Protectors Club. These are pictures of the Trindy River, which is the heart of our reservation. It flows directly in the middle of the valley, all throughout the valley from one end to the next. And it's, it's our life, it's our lifeline. It's the way of our life, it's our way of life. We use it for cultural re reasons and recreational reasons, everything. Our, it grows our basket materials. We perform dances near the river, on the river, around the river. During the summer, all, all we do is swim, all fish, there's fishing season. It, it's, it's really what makes us who we are. It makes everybody, everybody in this, on this reservation, everybody on our tribe, it makes us who we are. Our culture, our people, it, our life revolves around the river. It's so, it's so ingrained into our culture that it's part of our creation story. In our creation story, you'll hear the river mentioned. You'll hear these dance grounds mentioned. And year by year, it, okay, will you go, go to the next one? Regina, please. This is, these are pictures of our river. This one is from the 2002 fish kill. Um, our river, year by year, more water gets taken. Year, we don't, we don't, because of climate change, we don't get the winters we need. We don't get what, we don't, the river doesn't get, it's what it needs. And it turns into this. This was a picture of the 2002 fish kill where our salmon population was almost wiped out entirely. I mean, it still hasn't recovered and it's 18 years later. And at the rate that our water is being taken and they want to take more, they want to, they want to deplete the resources for our river. And soon, like if they keep, if they get their way, our salmon population will be 
inexistent it will be no more and our river will be our river already in the middle in the beginning of august it was di it was diagnosed with a blue green algae so that it's no longer it's no longer um swim you can't swim in it you can't use it it's it's toxic we have a river of poison flowing through our valley because people take people take from it they take its resources and no matter that's why we have to fight no matter what we we have to fight for this river because it's it's kept our people who we are for so long and now we have to do our very best to keep it to return it to what it used to be so maybe so that it can help our people return to what they used to be um so and okay yeah so these the, what does the water protectors club do we do many things i mean water we we protect the water i guess that's what that's what we do we go to hearings like regina was mentioning the one in reading we also went to one in um sacramento we went to the one in eureka we went to a board meeting we write letters we educate the public we actually held a um presentation in hoopa at the high school and to inform the public of what was going on and of the up and coming the up and coming um what what's it the up and coming meeting that governor newsom was going we were going to have in reading for the for the northern california people so that they would hear the dangers of the delta tunnels and whatnot and we fought really hard to get that meeting and we finally did but we didn't actually get to attend it because of corona um that was a big disappointment but actually getting that meeting was really cool it taught us that what we do is actually working that they they have to listen to us i mean obviously if they're 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 meeting with us and they're doing they're they're doing what the we're what we're asking and so that's pretty much what we do um we are we work one of our main things is we educate that's the pretty much the main thing that we we go to hearings and educate we really want the public and other people to know and not just the water protectors club what's going on and what they can do to help um so far this, i've talked about that that's pretty much what we've done so far a lot of hearings a lot of we wrote some letters educated the public okay next So what is the Delta Tunnel and how will it affect the Trinity River? It's intended to improve the way water supplies around the Delta, which is at the heart of California's water system. But we need to focus on the rivers that will be destroyed during this plan. This project will, won't be beginning until at least 2023 and the Department of Water Resources expects the overall conveyance project, if approved, will take up to 13 years to construct and commission. The water is already unhealthy and low. Taking more water from us without releasing the dam is a fish massacre waiting to happen, along with the other wildlife in and around the river. And not just the wi not just the wildlife, our cultural resources are are at stake here. The the river provides life for our willow sticks, our hazel sticks, our our basket materials, things been, that have been used since immemorial in our culture, and all the wildlife, the uh, the river, everything's at stake here. The, if more water is taken, the river will lower, the temperature will rise, and fish will die. And that's that's the end of the bottom line. There be they'll be taking a basic necessity from people who live here, and our whole life revolves around this river. They'll be taking our life. I mean, our culture from our people. So these are our plans once the pandemic is over and things settle a little bit, and we can get back to. Our, our club meetings and doing things. And we want to request more hearings closer to the water tribe so that our people shouldn't have to travel so far, especially when we, li we live an hour and a half from the nearest, you know, city, which it's not, it's not even a city. We live an hour and a half from anything, you know, big. And the, the other hearings, like the one we actually got scheduled was still two, two hours away. And a lot of people can't make that, can't make that, drive and we were we were working on getting the tribes to coordinate with us and send people like the Yurok tribe send a van the Hoopa tribe send a van the school send a van and we were actually getting that in place so but we do want to request hearing more hearings closer not just one I mean several and 
so that everybody has a chance to know what's going on, what they can do to help, how our river is at stake and whatnot. Um, we would also like to have more partnerships with different clubs and organizations. We have we were in contact with another youth group last year from a different tribe and we were actually planning on meeting but you know corona kind of put a stunt in all of our lives for a minute um we would like more members we actually have a pretty large club at the school i mean we have like 20 something kids and we only have 200 something in our school it's a pretty it's a pretty nice club but we would like it to be huge you know we want everybody involved with everything we want it to be school wide i mean school wide and then we want to get our people involved, like the Yurok tribe, the Yehupa tribe, everybody. We want it to be big. And we want, we want to fight this pipeline, but we also want to fight every other project that puts our water and our lifeline in danger. Okay, is that it? Um, yeah, yeah, we're gonna um, drop a petition against the Delta Tunnel into the chat here because um, while everyone is on COVID lockdown, Governor Newsom is pushing the tunnel forward and he actually asked the Army Corps of Engineers to give a Federal Clean Water Act permit to building this tunnel. Um, so just so people know, we have a new petition out. We're gonna drop it in the chat now. And Danielle, do you wanna introduce the next speaker? Yep, okay, next we have Aisha Wilson. She works with the Rogue River and she has something to say. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And give me one moment while I share my screen and set up my PowerPoint. Okay, I apologize. I cannot get the top like URL bar like off and I apologize I have my mask on because I'm in a shared office space right now but I would like to start with my own introduction. So, um, my name is Aisha Wilson and I am an enrolled member of the Klamath Tribes. I live here in Chiloquin, Oregon, so right above um, Northern California. So we're the very head of the Klamath Basin here. And I am the daughter of Bobby Wilson and Danita Herrera. I am currently um, starting my second year at the University of Oregon, and I intend to pursue a degree in environmental studies and a minor in legal studies and Native American Indigenous studies. And on this page, I just included a lot of my contact information in case anybody wants to reach out to me for anything. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about a few different things. I will talk about the Klamath Tribes Youth Leadership Council, the Rios Rivers Nonprofit Organization, and the Rogue Climate Nonprofit Organization. Currently, I am employed by Rogue Climate um, as the Oregon Green New Deal, but I've had a lot of work with the Youth Council as well as Rios Rivers. And these two pictures, I just wanted to start off and share these pictures. Um, they're not here in Chiloquin, Oregon, but throughout the Klamath Basin. I feel like it's like really necessary to share these pictures. And I know that um, there was a movement to blockade from the Pacific power to go to the river today. And so I just wanted to put these in there. And I wanted to like say really quickly that personally, I, I feel like um, this work is really necessary, especially by all this, all the youth on this call. I believe that the health of the environment is directly related to the health of our communities. And so, sorry, I think that when we think about a lot of these small communities, we see a lot of poor health, we see a lot of death, a lot of suicide, a lot of murder, a lot of diabetes, a lot of all these things that are really negative. And then in relation, we see a lot of our fish dying, we see our water being polluted by toxic algae, we see, our herds going down and these issues are really relevant and I think that they're really connected and so that's like where my passion comes in with the humanities and environmental side. But anyways, this is another picture I just wanted to share. And this is up at the Klamath Lake here in Chiloquin, Oregon. And our lake is so toxic that we cannot um, go into the water. We're not supposed to touch the water or anything. And so to start off, the Klamath Tribes Youth Council was founded a few years ago, and I worked with um, some other youth here in Chiloquin, Oregon, to get it going. And 
I wanted to share this mission statement by the Youth Council. So the purpose of the Klamath Tribes Youth Council is to provide a collective voice and represent Klamath tribal youth in all matters that concern to them, to serve as a means of mobilizing and coordinating actions of youth, other community members, and organizations toward positive goals, to promote the development of future tribal leaders, to help solve problems facing tribal youth, and to coordinate school and community service projects to promote the culture and traditions of the Klamath, Modoc, and Yehuskin Paiute people and to provide opportunities for youth to interact for fun and fellowship. And on this right hand side, I included a quote from the youth initiative uh, coordinator, Will Hess, and he wanted to just put this in here about how the Klamath Tribes Youth Council is involved in the work that they've done. Before I read this, I'd like to touch on um, a summit that we organized. I believe it was in 2018 and Sammy Jensaw was involved in the summit. We had a Klamath Youth Summit in Ashland, Oregon, and so we had people from all tribes, the Klamath, Karut, Kupa, and Yurok come up here. And I think that we had, I think, 50 to 60 youth that came up here, and so it wasn't a lot, but we were able to organize enough youth to come up here and just talk about all these different water issues and community issues, and so I thought that that was really amazing. Mm -hmm. But bear with me while I read this quote really quick. I'm going to start um, a little lower. Their vision is of a vibrant, culturally informed society where tribal values and practices passed down from time immemorial are exercised in the daily lives of tribal members. I mean, without access to clean water and healthy ecosystems, we have very little. But by working together, we can restore our homelands to, to a state more like those that our ancestors lived in and utilized to provide for our people since the beginning of time. It is vital that the tribal youth, as the next generation of tribal stewards of this land, have an active voice in issues facing our water and aboriginal homelands. From climate and changing, from climate change and dam removal to the threat of pipelines and settler colonialism. In the past, the Klamath Tribes Youth Council has been vocal in the fight against the proposed Jordan Cove LNG pipeline, as well as the promotion of clean energy bills to decrease the state's carbon footprint and keep big name corporations from contaminating water and air quality in small communities of color across the state. And then here's a few pictures. The top left, they're gathering um, tulis out by the lake. This bottom left, we were representing the Klamath Tribes Youth Council in San Diego, California at the Unity Conference. And then this picture to the right, we have Hannah Schroeder, the current co-chair of the Youth Council, um, speaking at a LNG event in Klamath Falls. And then here is Will has the lead youth initiative coordinator and Hannah Schroeder, the co-chair's contact information. Next, I will talk about um, the Roost Rivers. So Roost Rivers is a nonprofit organization and they're based out of Colorado. And so um, Roost Rivers has been really like prominent in the Klamath Basin since 2017. They hosted an exchange, it was a month long where they came and they brought 10 Chilean students and then they had 10 Klamath students as well as Warrior Institute on the river for a whole month straight. And what we did was we started up in Chilicoan, Oregon and we went down throughout the whole basin. And after the dams, we would get in and raft and kayak down all the way to Rekwa, California to the mouth of the ocean. And so it was a really good, um, community building um, time. And so a lot came out of that, but really quick, I would like to read the mission statement that they have. Um, Rios River's mission is to inspire the protection of rivers through youth-focused experiential and educational cross-culture exchange programs where underserved students are empowered to become informed stewards and ambassadors for their rivers and the communities who depend on them. And then on that right hand side, I just have a little um, blurb about the different Rios River staff members. And then I have personally participated in four different trips that they've hosted. Um, the first one, like I mentioned, was in the Klamath in 2017. And then um, in 2018, we traveled to Chile. And so we took 10 Klamath students again. So we had Sammy Jensaw's brothers. Um, 
and then some people from the Karuk tribe and others from, I think, Idaho that went with us. And then the third trip that I was involved in was on the Klamath last July. And so for that trip, we actually went up to Washington to begin and we seen the dam that was removed on the Elwha River. And then we traveled from there to Chiloquin, Oregon, and then started another trip on the Klamath. And so once again, we got in after the dams and we would raft all the way down to the mouth of the ocean, right down to Requa again. And then the last trip I was involved in was in Chile in 2019. And we were supposed to be um, representing the Klamath at the United Nations uh, Conference in Santiago. But then that was canceled, the COP25, due to all the riots and protests in Santiago, and it was moved to Spain. And so we actually had a few youth still go over to Spain and represent at that conference. And then the rest of us um, traveled throughout Chile. This picture was taken on the Klamath. As you can see, there's a lot of different people. We had people from Asia, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, um, Colorado, Idaho, Washington, and Arizona, I believe. And so what is really amazing about these youth exchanges is it brings people from all different types of communities, different languages, different cultures, and different experiences. And it, we all come together just to talk about water. And so the entire um, mission of this is free flowing water. And so a lot of it has incorporated a lot of um, educational, like related to environmental concerns. And so we, every day that we would sit down and we would talk about different things and we would have translators come in. It was just really good. And I think that, um, a lot of my work was brought from this organization. I met Sammy Jensaw down there. And so since then we've maintained a relationship from the beginning of this basin all the way to the end of the basin, which is really amazing. And then here I have Weston Boyles, who's the founder slash director, his contact information, and then Roast Rivers mailing address if you ever want to reach out. The last thing I will talk about today is Rogue Climate, who I currently work for. Um, right now, what I do for Rogue Climate is outreach for the Oregon Green New Deal. So that is a new environmental climate-driven policy platform that's being introduced for Oregon here. But Rogue Climate's mission statement is to empower Southern Oregon communities most impacted by climate change, including low income, um, small town youth and communities of color to win climate justice by organizing for clean energy, sustainable jobs, and a healthy environment. We do so through leadership development, political education, and fostering conversations and campaigns for policies that benefit our communities over the special interests of the largest corporations. The three primary campaigns that Road Climate focuses on is to stop the Jordan Cove LNG export terminal and the Pacific Connector frac gas pipeline proposed in Southern Oregon. And that has been a big thing. There's been a lot of conversation and, and involvement from not only Southern Oregon, but also Northern California. The second is to transition communities in the Rogue Valley to clean energy through local energy um, action plans, as well as community solar and energy efficiency campaigns. And then the last is to pass climate policy at the state level that will spur clean energy investment and job creation in small communities, low-income communities, and communities of color in Oregon. And then they do these things through a few different um, areas. First, they like to focus on local action. They also focus on state action, leadership development, and that is where a lot of the youth comes in. Um, they help youth practice um, the skills needed to bring about practical solutions. And so they do a lot of internships, fellowships, and workshops, as well as like online webinars now to get the youth involved and get them um, to a state where they're able to advocate and give them the tools that they need for their own communities. And then they also focus on climate justice and cultural engagement. And then really quick, I know that this is mostly like a Northern California webinar, but I wanted to speak about the Oregon Green New Deal, which is what I focus on. And so the Oregon Green New Deal is a new um, policy platform that's being introduced. The first one was um, in the 1900s. It was the first New Deal, and that did focus on environmental and climate um, issues, but the issue was it only focused on the needs of white communities. And so I left out a lot of the communities that face actual climate issues 
at home. And so um, for the Oregon Green New Deal, there's a big emphasis on having the BIPOC community, which is Black, Indigenous, people of color being included and in being advocated for, for their needs and the challenges that they face. But the seven main pillars are listed right there. And the tour timeline for this is right now they're looking to publish the first Oregon Green New Deal 2.0 platform in January 2021. And the reason I wanted to talk about this was Rio Climate just recently met with the organization writing the policy um, about like a tribal liaison. And so right now we realized that the only outreach that they did to indigenous communities was here in Klamath. And it was only because I did that. And so um, me and Ali Rosenbluth, my supervisor reached out to this organization to see if they could commit to reaching out to all of the nine federally organized, recognized uh, tribes in Oregon before January, 2021. And so right now we're working on getting a tribal liaison set up. And I wanted to say this because I think that the connection between government to government is really um, non-existent when it comes to policies and decisions for tribal nations in the United States. And so it was a big deal to have um, any involvement from my tribe and their feedback on this policy before it was published. And so I'm really pushing for that to happen for all the other tribes here in Oregon. And then this photo is at the Salem State Capitol when we had um, a lobbying day in there. And I believe that we also had quite a few people from the Hoopa tribe that were present at this as well. And then on the right hand side, I also have the contact information for my supervisor, Allie, and then her supervisor, Hannah. And that's it. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, thank you to all the panelists that were able to make it here today. Um, it's a really amazing panel. Um, I do have another video I could show, but um, first I wanted to um, open up the discussion a little bit because I think this is such an, an impressive panel. So if people wanted to turn their um, videos on and their mics. Um, also, if anyone has questions and if you wanna drop them in the question and answer box, um, we will make sure to ask him. But um, I just wanted to ask um, the panel in general, like, why do you all feel as youth, you know, that is, I mean, I know Kylie couldn't make it today. And I'm really sorry that Kylie from the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club couldn't make it today. And Marie Bates was also going, going to make it today. But um, she had trouble getting on because she is actually waiting on the river for Pacific Corps and her cell phone service wasn't very good. But for the people who did not hear at the beginning of the webinar, Pacific Power who owns the Klamath Dams is actually on the Klamath River right now meeting with tribal councils because they are possibly threatening to pull out of Klamath River Dam removal, which many of us have been working on for um, at least eight, 16 to 18 years. And I know a lot of the people on the panel have not even been alive as long as we've been working on Klamath Dam removal. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about the youth activism on the Klamath and um, Trini Rivers is that it is so intergenerational. There are people that I know who were youth during um, during the fish wars, you know, and I think it's um, really amazing that all these youth stand up the way that they do and that even so many of them were on the river today. I mean, kids as young as four years old were on the river today asking Pacific Corps, holding banners and asking Pacific Corps to take down the Klamath Dams. And a lot of the kids who grew up in the Klamath Dam removal movement are now, you know, scientists and lawyers or people like Sammy who started nonprofits to help other youth get involved in these kind of things. So why do you all feel as um, tribal youth on the Klamath and Trinity Rivers that, that it's important for you to be involved with this work? And how do you feel about the fact that you are um, have to do this work at such a young age when really you shouldn't be able to be out enjoying being a teenager more? Um, so yeah, that's my question for whoever would want to take it. Like, why do you think it's so important for the youth to be involved? And how do you feel about having to be involved for the struggle? And what are your hopes for the future? Um, so yeah, whoever wanted to, uh, maybe um, Danielle or Sammy, if one of you guys wanted to talk. Um, I think it's really important to get youth involved because youth are the future. I mean, we're fighting for our kids to have the river. We're fighting for our kids to have 
the same experience and the same love and connection that comes with that river and our people. We're fighting for our kids to have that and we're fighting for us to have that for the rest of our lives. We're the only generation who has who is in danger of losing that, you know? We're the only ones who it like if things don't change, our river won't be there for our kids. Our fish won't be there. That connection, that love that brings our people together, that makes my people who are the hoop of people who they are, it won't be there. That connection's not gonna be there for my kids. And I I don't know, that connection made me who I am. That river made me who I am. I don't know, I don't want my kids to have to grow up without it. I mean, we're, if it's from picking up my gramps from fishing or if it's jumping off Big Rock with my friends or watching the boat dances, picking sticks, that river is the mo one of the most important things in my tribe's life. And it, it made it, the experience that it gave me made me who I am today. And without it, I don't like, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be advocating for water. I wouldn't be so interested in what I've been doing. And my hope for the future is that one day we won't have to do this. You know, one day big corporations will think of the environment before they think of their wallets. They'll think of people before they think of money. I mean, that's the hope and that would, that tribes aren't like tribes have a bigger voice because this is our land. My, we were never moved. This land is, has been Hoopa people's land since time immemorial. This is where we've been since the beginning of time. Our create, the place, the dance ground where our creators, our creation story comes from is a 10 minute drive from my house. I mean, I, I hope that in the future tribes have more, more voice over their own land, more, more voice on what's being done with it, on this is how you treat it. This is how you make it. This is how it's been here for so long. This is why it's so beautiful. This is why it's still healthy because this is how we take care of it. And this is how it needs to be taken care of. I just hope that the tribe has that voice, every tribe for their own land. That's my hope for the future. And that's why I fight foot so hard for the water. Thank you. Does anyone else have, um, want to say why they feel like it's so important for youth to be involved in this kind of work and what their hopes for the future are? If not, we have more questions too. Okay, well, the next question is for Sammy. Um, hopefully you're there, Sammy. Um, it's, I want to find out more about the meeting between Pacific Corps and tribal leaders that's taking place. Is there somewhere I can look for an update or any kind of outcomes? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. So, uh, basically the meeting that went down today, um, we couldn't really tell a lot of people about it or where it was going on because we couldn't compromise the overall mission. But, um, hopefully, uh, kind of like mimicking what she just said, but hopefully Pacific Corps makes the right decisions today and they want to work with our tribal leaderships to make sure these dams come down so we don't have to buy the troops and get everybody together. But if that's not the case and Pacific Corps does not want to commit to dam removal, then there will be plenty of opportunities to be involved coming up. And so stay tuned, look on, make sure you follow the um, social medias like Instagram, Save California Salmon, uh, Ancestral Guard. We'll be dedicating time and energy to these things more and more and more. Great. Um, so I actually noticed that we have a guest speaker that I didn't expect to be on today. Um, and that is, we have someone here from um, Stop Corporate Salmon, um, which is, I think, the name of the group. Um, but I just wanted to welcome Esta, Esta, Esta I'm sorry, I forgot how to say your name. Pronounce but, um, it. Thank you for making it. I think it's really important for people to know that we are actually fighting a fish farm right here on, um, on the uh, Eureka Bay area. Um, so there's a large salmon farm that could go in there on Samoa. Um, and I think that I can speak for a lot of people that Klamath River people and people up and down California are very concerned about fish farming and we do not want it in California or Oregon. So yeah, if you could talk to us just for a few minutes about why you came on today and about what kind of role youth might play in stopping fish farming and um, genetically engineered salmon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here. Um, and uh, I think it was some quick coordination because we're actually um, 
wanted to take this opportunity to promote a digital action that's happening. And so I'll give a little bit of, of context for me and what we're trying to do, um, how people can plug in and what the digital action is. So um, my name is Estefania um, and I go by they, them pronouns. I live in Duwamish Kosedish land here, otherwise known as Seattle. And um, I'm part of Uprooted and Rising, which is um, basically a network of people that are, are uh, largely young people, but not all, um, of super majority black indigenous and people of color that are trying to essentially um, shift uh, the way that higher education is perceived um, and the kind of uh, knowledge that is coming out of higher education being influenced by agribusiness and big food companies that essentially manipulate research um, that uh, then ends up influencing foreign policy, uh, public policy, and doesn't benefit the public um, and results in genocide and, um, and all over the world and the destruction of indigenous food systems and local food systems everywhere. And so, um, you know, Uprooted and Rising is made up of a lot of people that have a lot of different stakes in this like big, big fight. So Uprooted and Rising is trying to create a big umbrella to, to basically um, um, make it unacceptable for higher education to continue to promote um, deadly policies essentially um, and skewed research and like putting their lending their purchasing power and all this power behind that. And so um, we were invited um, to engage with the issue of genetically modified semen. And we learned that Sea Grant universities, um, which are uh, receive funding from NOAA, which is the North, oh my gosh, I always screw this up. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric something. Um, but they, the way that, you know, the USDA um, gives funding to land grant universities uh, NOAA gives funding to Sea Grant universities. And so Sea Grant universities are apparently at the helm of pushing research that basically essentially is, um, is uplifting genetically modified semen as uh, this new innovation. But actually what it is, is um, kind of a, a way in which corporations are pushing the next frontier of colonization and privatization of the ocean. And so um, at this point, we actually began with this campaign with the intention of absolutely um, reaching out to as many, um, we are not all indigenous and we want to recognize that this struggle is something that, you know, anything that has to do with salmon has been fought by salmon people for longer than we even know. Um, and so we um, have so far um, invited a lot of people to participate into, in this campaign um, and we um, are building, we're committing ourselves basically to, uh, we're committing ourselves to holding a timeline and some momentum around this because it's um, happening very quickly. Um, so the company Aquabounty that is planning on releasing the genetically modified fish has been uh, farming or breeding salmon eggs in Indiana, in a plant in Indiana, in the middle of the country, so away from the sea and the ocean, um, and uh, they've they they are planning to release um, this genetically modified salmon breeded in Indiana, um, somewhat in their what they call their last quarter, which could is as early as September, um, and so in the next month, and so that's why. We're trying to pick up a little bit of speed now that we've brought a lot of folks to the table, been able to shape to the narrative um, more deeply and invite every single one of you, especially um, Native youth and Native people, um, to join this conversation and help us continue to shape the narrative because it's only going to, we're only going to need um, support. And we also, you know, it's very amazing to hear all the work that you all are doing. And so I think that we would love to, um, to partner, to uplift, to do whatever it is that we can to be in reciprocity to what y'all are doing as well. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna share a link with everybody, but, oh, here we go, all pan panelists and attendees. And so, um, so I'm sharing this link, which is the link that we're using as, as our interest form. Um, it's a bit.ly. And so you can go to that bit.ly and fill it out if you would like to be involved with the campaign. But otherwise, I'm going to um, I'm going to sh quickly share my screen and just show you all um, the call to action and hope that you all can participate. And um, hopefully I didn't take too long explaining a little bit of what we're trying to do. 
Um, but this is the first action that we do, and it's just um, basically an opportunity to to give the mic to many to others and ask them, um, ask them to say why they would oppose genetically modified salmon. And so we're so grateful for this invitation to bring this to y'all because you all, um, everything that you're doing, I think, connects um, and uplifts um, this as well. And um, and it seems like a great audience to be able to um, amplify your own message through this action. And so this is the Instagram page. And I just wanted to show you, um, this is the Instagram page. I think you probably can see my screen now. Um, and so if you go to Block Corporate Salmon, if you wanna take a second to do that, um, that's the Instagram account. And then uh, we actually are also involved with the fight to stop uh, the TMT telescope that is getting that is being threatened to be built on Mauna Kea. And so we actually borrowed this idea from the folks that are plugged in uh, in that campaign um, to do photo petitions. And so basically give people the space to fill in the blank for why they refuse genetically engineered salmon. Um, and so, yeah, would it be OK if we just give people a minute to do this? Right now, um, yes, we can give what we can give a minute. We only have about a little, maybe twenty minutes left in the webinar. So yeah, one minute. Go do it right now if you can. Okay, thank you. I'll just scroll through the slides here that you can see. So here, so that you can see. Um, and while you're taking action, please also, as soon as you do this, go and sign the petition to take down the Klamath River dams and sign the petitions to uh, make sure that the Bay, De Bay Delta Tunnel is not built. Because um, like we said before, there is the Trump administration is now working with Gavin Newsom to get a Clean Water Act permit for the Bay Delta Tunnel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, the link will continue to be, while we do um, our question and answer, the link will continue to be up here. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Um, so let's see what the next question is. Um, also, I wanted to ask real quick, um, our, one of our interns who's been doing a lot of um, youth organizing with us, Cody, is on here. And um, Cody, if you have anything that you want to say about why um, youth organizing is so important and what it's like to um, be a youth who works on salmon issues, who then has to um, leave home and deal with lack of salmon and um, th things of that nature, um, you are welcome to talk now. Um, and then um, you have five minutes to say whatever you need to, and then we will do more question and answer, and then we will be done. But thank you so much for joining us today, Cody. Yeah, you yeah, all do. Um, Cody Henriksen, Echelon, Sukpiak, Chu Dena'ina, Echelon. Hello, my name is Cody Henriksen. I am of Sukpiak and Dena'ina descent. I'm an enrolled member of the Ninilchik Village Tribe of Alaska. Um, I grew up, I'm a salmon person as well. We uh, very much rely on it, and it's one of the few cultural traditions that has been left within my family um, and my tribe, you know, after so many years of assimilation and erasure. And while in Alaska, we don't fight the same problems of water issues here, I've been fortunate enough to move to California here and live in Arcata for over 10 years now, um, and I've learned so much, and it's really been through the amazing efforts of the community here. And especially recently, as I've been getting involved with uh, Save California Salmon um, and even the Food Sovereignty Lab on HSU's campus, I'm finding it, it's, it's kind of amazing because I never saw myself as like an activist or a protector or anything. I just saw myself as a person who cared about the rivers and the fish and my traditional foods and as I started becoming more involved with things like it's it's kind of weird all of a sudden you're put up there as an activist or like a protector but it's it's really true it's because these resources are so valuable to us and you know showing our you know our youth and our elders like the importance of these things and then being able to illustrate that on a larger basis to everyone here today is really the basis of a lot of this work and I, I really just want to encourage everyone that like it's so easy to get involved and to start 
Um, and there's many small ways we can start. There's many big ways you can start, whether it's signing petitions now we've given you today, or it's actually becoming more active members in these protests and these hearings, and just becoming a more involved and informed member. And something that you can do, whether you're native or not, or um, indigenous or not, is to really inform yourself about these issues in your areas. Because I guarantee you there are water issues in your area that you just need to research. You know, whether it's these reservoirs that are going in that will affect, you know, our, us here or even people down south, there's things to get involved with. And I also implore you to like learn about the indigenous peoples on your lands. And that's really huge steps to like going towards that and something that's not just about acknowledging the land you live on, but about doing something about that. You know, um, land acknowledgements are great and all, but they should really also have call to actions. And that's what we really hope to do here today. And what I highly recommend is our webinars, our um, week long series we're going to have on water justice, because that's what that will be is action oriented. It's going to be a really great um, week where we're going to have um, multiple things we can do within every day of uh, different actions you can take to help feel involved and get involved. And I highly recommend those. And it looks like we might be ready to pop back. Um, yeah, I hopefully um, Murray Bates has joined us, but I'm not sure if um, if it will let her unmute. So. Um, Murray, if you hear us, I think you have to agree to unmute. And when I see you unmute, I can um, introduce you again. But yeah, I've asked you to, and um, for some reason it's not working. So as soon as I see anyone sees Murray, uh, oh, there she is. Yeah, so Murray Bates is here today. Um, I'm asking her to start her video, um, but she is also a member of the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club. And she is um, someone who I've worked with um, for most of her life. So it's so exciting to have you here, Mamuri. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. Um, did you want Do you want to, to tell us something? a little bit about, well, if you'd like, um, Danielle spoke about the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club and the work that you've all done on um, to stop the Delta Tunnel. Um, if you wanted to talk a little bit about the work that you um, do, and I know that a lot of the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club does um, to try to take down the Klamath Dams, um, that would be great. Um, and if not, if you don't want to speak, that's fine too, of course. Yeah. Um, well, the um, Pacific Corps just had their meeting, like you guys know, and um, they came back and we gave them a flag. And if like they were waving it, then we we're like gonna give up. Or, like they're taking down the dam. But if they had it down, then uh, like the dam uh, protests and stuff are back on. And it looked like they didn't have it. So I guess it's back on. Okay, well, hopefully that's not the final, um, the yeah. final say. So yeah, today when um, people went along the bank of the river, they gave Pacific Corps a white flag and they asked if the meeting went well and they agreed to undam the Klamath for them to wave the white flag. But it sounds like you're saying they came by and they did not do that. Yeah, I didn't see it. I mean, I was up in the car, but I didn't see anything. Well, I think it's really amazing that Mamuri is down on the river today um, asking Pacific Corps to take down the Klamath Dams with her whole family. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you want to say, Mamuri, about why you think it's important to be a youth activist or what it's like um, growing up fighting for your river? No, I didn't really think of anything. Um, okay, well, yeah. thank you for joining us. Um, uh -huh. So um, I had, we have a couple more questions. So I'm going to get back to the questions of ans and answers. Um, one of them is from Meg, and she says, I'm a 70 year old um, non native woman, and I'm very sorry for our failures to keep the river safe and the earth safe for our youth. What do you need most from people like me? 
Um, yeah, so it doesn't say who the question's from. So if anyone um, on the youth panel wants to talk about that, sounds like, looks like Danielle turned her video on. Um, I just think that one of the really, I always stress that education is key, knowing what's going on with the rivers, knowing what's, how, what is endangering them and knowing what you can do about it. I mean, any, any big, any big thing going on with the river, like the LNG pipeline, we wrote letters to the governor of Oregon. We sat there in our, in our meetings with the Water Protectors Club for an hour and everybody from our high school wrote a letter on how that was going to affect our, us and that's how, how we're hours away and that was still going to affect us and why that was going to affect us and why they shouldn't do it. And I just really think that education is key. You have to educate yourself on the, the, the dangers the rivers are facing and there's always something to do whether it's telling other people like if you're educated yourself you can educate other people you can say this is what's going on and this is how you can stop it and just that word of mouth spreading the word and have letting ha educating more people so that more people know what's going on and more people can take that stand that's huge that's what i always personally that's when people ask how they can help i feel that's how that's what i always stress educate yourself so that you can educate others so that more people can take a stand Awesome. Does anyone else have anything they want to say on that one? I'll um, look through to see whose cameras are on. And if your camera's on, I'll think that you mean you want to answer the question since it's such a great and large panel today. Awesome. Well, I have a question and my question is actually one of our panelists that was supposed to be here today, but she can't because um, it's the beginning of the school year and um, the way that COVID-19 has happened. Um, the educators are having a really hard time keeping up. Um, but Margot Robbins from the um, Indian Education Director for our local school district was supposed to be here today. And Margot Robbins is such an inspiration as um, an educator that makes sure that the youth knows what's happening and gets involved. And so my question, one of the things we wanted to talk about a little here today is, um, you know, I've heard this a lot from people that I work with, but like why we're taking down statues of colonizers and slave owners, you know, there's also talk about, well, let's not just tear down these statues and rebuild something better, but let's talk about our education. Like, what are we learning in our schools? Like, are we still learning that these people are heroes who have destroyed our environment and, um, you know, colonized land and not left anything for the future? And so my question for um, different people on the panel, if they want to speak, is what do you want to see as far as, um, you know, a student about how um, your education could be different and be um, set up. I mean, as a Hoopa High School water protectors, I think there is like a little bit of a um, better education happening because there are people like Margo making sure that there's um, some real education going on as far as history and water. But like, what can we do to make education better and more inclusive of everyone? Like, how do we rebuild the educational system in the way that we teach each other in a way that feels more equitable. Um, so yeah, for whoever would like to talk a little bit about what you would like to see um, as students um, from your educators. Anyone has any thoughts on that? Sammy, do you have anything? Because I mean, you had something really great to say about how you were inspired through education or through unfairness in, in your education. Um, really, well, we've just been really focused on at home before you enter the education system. And I believe with this next generation, that's where it really starts. I mean, if you want people to make healthy decisions and do what's right, then they're going to need the proper building blocks to stand upon to do that. So it all starts with, um, access to healthy opportunities for the family as a whole and our community and being able to provide those opportunities. Like for instance, it's time for our tribal leaders and everybody start investing in proper food sovereignty that supports the people and supports the family right here in our local communities. We need to start looking at diverse ways of investing in our own people. So by the time uh, these, these young adults need to start making those decisions, um, they have everything they need to make sure they're making the right decision. And that's where we're looking at. That's where we're trying to rebuild those blocks for these young people to stand upon. And I think that's important. So, yeah. Great. Um, 
I want to, and then one thing I like to touch on with the education is um, history books are such a problem. History books are wrote with the intent of making the United States and America you know, not so bad. They they glide over the genocide and they they don't talk about the what actually happened because they don't want America and the United States to look so bad. They don't want people to know that America was founded on genocide and murder, but it was. And I mean, in Hoopa High, it's not, we get taught what, what actually happens. Our history teacher, we don't learn from a book. We learn from packets that he writes because he, he t our first lesson was how history books are a lie. And so I think that's a really big, I'm not sure how the steps to solve that or whatever, but I know that that's a big issue that the history books that 90% of high schools learn from are lies and they, they glorify the people who committed genocide and they, they skip over the genocide entirely because they don't want, they don't want people to know how America was founded and that it's not a broken system. Now it's, it's never been an unbroken system. It's never been whole. And that's, that's a big problem. I think programs like the Indian Ed Center are really, really vital in things like this because they have their own curriculum and they spread it to the elementary school and they and high, the high school too. And we do things with them. And that just, if now, now all those people are educated. Like I said, education is key. All those people have the proper education. They have the knowledge to go tell other people, no, that's not how that went down. This is what happened. And you can, this is my history teacher's information. This is how I learned this. And here's, you can go do the same exact thing. I think I, programs like that are very vital in fighting the, the lies and um, things in education. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I have I'm not hearing, sorry. Okay, sorry, I got muted and then unmuted. Um, yeah, there, we have a couple hosts, so it's a little confusing. Um, so my question is for um, Asia um, to speak about the um, the Klamath Youth Council or the Klamath Tribes Youth Council. Um, one of the things I've been really impressed with with um, the work of Rogue Climate and the work of the Klamath Tribe Youth Council is that how it's made. Um, the conversation around the LNG pipeline, building an LNG pipeline across our river, um, so much more, um, uh, so much more civil, and especially in Klamath Falls, which could be kind of a hard place to have um, serious conversations. It's um, you know very Republican area, um, so I was wondering if we could speak a little bit about how youth activists kind of change the way um, people have conversations and um, how it might help the dialogue to be a little more respectful and less entrenched. Okay. Um, yeah, oh, I yeah. think, yeah, sorry. I think that up here in like Klamath Falls and Chilliquin, I think that like water, regardless of if it's dam removal, irrigation or pipeline related, um, it's such a, conflicting conversation and there's always like a lot of different thoughts and there's a lot of like systemic racism that has been embedded into um our communities here and so i think that a big thing was the klamath tribes youth leadership council um that really did help us up here and um since we've established that youth council we've had an avenue for youth to be able to advocate in a way where it's not a negative conversation it's not political it's um, youth based and so I think that um, since that we've been able to build a, a better and stronger community up here along with other nonprofit organizations. I don't know if that answered your question Regina but I think that the Youth Council has really created an avenue for youth to speak up here and to participate in these conversations that are really vital. I think that before it was kind of like I don't know it was like there's a stigma around it and we've only had um, our tribal leaders like Don Gentry and other council members participating in these and so I think that the Youth Council just created an avenue to not only speak about dam removal and water quality and quantity but also the LNG campaign, um, different forestry projects and different policies going on. I don't know if that answered your question but 
Um, yeah, no, it definitely does. Like I said, I've really seen the way the conversations in Klamath Falls happen, change based on the work of the Youth Council. And I really thank you guys for that. Um, so we have uh, one more question. Um, and then um, we can go to 1.30, but if we're done, then we can also um, just be done and that's fine too. Um, so the last question we have is, um, and if anyone else has a question, feel, please feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but it's, I'm curious what the panelists think about the work that they are doing, um, uh, how, your, how your peers, the other youth that you um, go to school with feel about the work that you're doing. And if you have any recommendations on how to get more youth involved and interested in restoring rivers and salmon. Um, yeah, and if anyone wants to answer that question, they can just put their uh, camera on. This is the largest panel we had, so it's a little harder to figure out who would answer which question if the questions aren't towards one person. So yeah, what do your um, peers think about the work you're doing and what are your recommendations to get more youth involved in issues such as this? Well, I can speak on this if okay. you want to Regina. Um, I am, I just turned 18 years old like a week ago. And so although I am 18, I'm going into my sophomore year at the University of Oregon. And so I finished um, school a little bit earlier, but um, so that just means like my peers are kind of older, you know, um, not as young, but I think that here at Chiloquin High School that the native students, because we do have a majority of native and then white students here. I think that all the native students have really been able to like me and just like uh, growing up together they've really had that connection where they're able to like go and do these types of things and um, I think that the youth council as well as the tribes involvement and presence has made it so like these are fun things to do and these are like things that they want to do you know so it's really like there's incentives to like go to school or leave school early you know to go to these events and like uh, participate and be able to like learn a lot of these cultural things and so I think that um, the tribe's presence has helped the youth to want to work towards this. And then Danielle, if you want to share. Yeah, um, this is, I, it was, at, I've been, I've been working with Margo. She's my mentor. I've been working with her since I was like in eighth grade. I think I went to my first thing for the, it was the note for the LNG pipeline. We went up to Oregon for, and you know, I just, I was so nervous about speaking in front of people. I was not a very social child. And Margo really, Margo made me, she forced me to talk in front of people, made me meet new people. And I mean, she's the one, she's the reason I'm on this panel today. And she, she made me more, she made me more outgoing. And so when I got into high school and we started doing, we started the um, Water Protectors Club, I worked really closely with Margo throughout that. And we just, we work really hard to, we have a lot of Native kids in our school too. Over half of our population is Native. And um, it was, so we all have that connection to the river. We all have that connection that it's needed and it's, it's vital for our, for our life. And so it was, a, it's, it's a, it was easier to get people involved because everyone already cares about the river. Everybody already doesn't want to see it to go bad. And so we just stressed that, we just stressed the importance, like, well, if, if we don't do it, who's going to? Like they listen, we're youth, they, they, people aren't expecting kids, you know, to step up and fight for their river and fight for what they, is right. And so when kids do, it's, it's powerful and it makes an impact. So we just started the Water Protectors Club. And at first we didn't have a lot of members, but then I talked to a lot, like my, I talked to my friends and they talked to their friends about what we were doing and what our goal was and the how we do have fun we have fun on our trips and but and it is it is work and but we we do have a long we do have a big club now because and it's it's because the native students have that connection to the river and they have that the tribe hasn't been the like as involved as we'd like it's mostly been margo and the school but we're hoping to change that this year and stuff but with the peer everybody a lot of people at Hoopa High respect what we're doing. If Even if they can't jump in and help, they do respect what we're doing. And people even in our club that aren't in our club help sometimes. So they, it, it, was, it was difficult at first to get a lot of my peers to 
take this as important and m make it part of their life. But once a few did, it caught on like wildfire. Everybody wanted to do it. Everybody sees what the river needs. And it was really cool to watch at Hoopa High how it went from like two students to four students. And now there's 30 of us in the club and 20 people who show up sometimes. Yeah, it was, it's pretty nice. And I think it does have a lot to do with the native kids having a connection to the river and a connection to each other, growing up together and being related to one another and whatnot. Awesome, thank you, Danielle. We have um, one more question. Um, but before I get to that question, I would like to speak as um, just really quickly as an adult about like, um, as that was an adult who asked that question. Um, I think it's important also to remember that um, youth don't necessarily have um, cars and computers and good phones and the things that are necessary to do this work. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that um, youth within your community are supported, and especially the people whose families might not be helping them out with it. Um, you know, like we tried to start um, a, a fund that's for youth that want to do this kind of work to be able to get computers if they need computers. And we have another fund that's for um, getting people gas money if they need to, if they want to go to these meetings that are far away. But I think it's important to remember to like monetarily support um, youth and youth action be or to support them by um, making sure that people can get rides to the places that they need and can get some of their basic necessities taken care of, you know, or like um, get jobs here and there and things of that nature. Because um, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of youth that want to do this work are not necessarily supported by their families. And if they are supported by their families, that doesn't mean their families have the resources to be able to send them on trips that could take cost hundreds of dollars. I mean, I know every time the Hoopa High School Water Protectors Club wants to go somewhere, it's a lot of fundraising and um, it could take a lot of bake sales to get like 30 youth to Sacramento. So um, yeah, we should make sure that the schools are um, and the clubs are monetarily supported and that adults are making sure that youth are being able to do the things that they need to do. Um, so then there's one last question. And after the last question, we're going to stop it because the um, webinar is almost over and we actually have to um, have a few announcements before it's over. So the last question, and um, I don't know if Cody might want to answer this, but uh, um, or Sammy, um, but are there any youth state um, youth statewide that are groups that have ties to the area, and um, are, are local tribes being outreached to through these youth groups, and if so, how? So some of the work I've been doing with Save California Salmon is also with another uh, entity to called uh, Youth Organized California. They're a really amazing organization that uh, prioritize uh, historically um, unheard voices, typically indigenous. And um, there's also, uh, I think they work with a lot of like queer and uh, cross-gender uh, kids. And there's, um, they do a lot of really cool work about um, throughout the state of environmental racism and issues affecting uh, kids all throughout the state. And we actually did a, um, a youth-wide state assembly all on Zoom not so long ago where it was like over 300 participants on the Zoom call and there are all these kids from uh, different organizations that came and spoke and it was a really great um, experience and they're actually continuing to do some work with Save California Salmon here so we're helping facilitate that so and we really do hope to work more with them in the future. And we do have a few other groups uh, that we work with as well. So there's there's a lot of cool stuff going on. It's just right now, it's a little difficult with uh, COVID restrictions is really some of the biggest problems we're facing, uh, problems of accessibility. And uh, just, um, you know, it's really hard to, you know, have these meetings now when they're all virtual online and you don't have necessarily even a good cell phone collect connection in some of these communities. Thank you. Um, Carrie, did you have something that you wanted to say um, as far as uh, the statewide youth organizing? I saw you emailed or you put something, but I didn't understand it. Um, I was just actually kind of trying to get Cody to talk about the Food Sovereignty Lab and cultural workspace that we're working on at HSU, which 
ties. I mean, I, I think that all of this ties into like everything that we're working on kind of ties into each other, right? Like food sovereignty is like hugely important and obviously like the salmon being a major part of that. Um, so I don't know, Cody, do you want to like just chat about that for a sec? Yeah, I could give a quick little blurb about that. Um, sorry. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Lab at HSU is a really great initiative that we've been moving forward that started through activism. Um, it was actually a classroom desire that for um, one of the classes at Humboldt State University, they, the class wanted to seize a longer lasting um, something, a class project that wasn't just a presentation or something in the end, we wanted something tangible. And after through extensive research and interviews with indigenous uh, faculty, staff, students, and community members, what we really came to through kind of like discussions and also merging a bunch of ideas was this idea of a food sovereignty lab. So it will be like a cultural workspace that will have, a, it will be a physical space on campus that will help facilitate like classroom meetings for, uh, and lab meetings for anything revolving around indigenous food sovereignties. There'll also be a place for uh, research, uh, cultural workshops, like including regalia making, basketry, and a really big goal that we're hoping for this space, because the space we did secure um, is a little smaller, uh, but we really uh, want, um, especially with COVID and everything going on, is we want this to be like a, a place to have webinars and to have live courses and everything too. And we hope to facilitate, and we already are working with a bunch of community organizations uh, to facilitate uh, working with tribes and their programs they already have going that are related to food sovereignty and food issues. And um, we're already getting amazing speakers listed for a series that we have planning coming up. And in the next two years, it's a lot of planning we have going on, but it's just, it's an amazing thing. And it's one of the first things of its kind in the CSU system. So it's, it's a really amazing um, thing. I highly, oh, no. I highly oh, <laughs> well, keep um, an eye out for all our updates going on with it. Uh, it's it's incredibly great. I can just say as a student who came to Humboldt and I lost a lot of my traditions, even though I'm in a place that's known for its rivers and its peoples. And it wasn't until I really started pursuing my education beyond marine biology and Native American studies and started making those connections with tribal leaders around here and my teachers and everything like that, that I really started to, you know, um, get that connection again and so having a space like that on campus where native students could come to still practice their traditions would be invaluable and it's also a place where we hope to facilitate research and community organizing and um, lectures and it's I only see amazing things for the future for it. Well, thank you so much, Cody. So with that, um, we're going to have to finish up for the day. Um, so I wanted to remind everyone again to please fill out your evaluation forms if you are taking um, the certification program or at all. It really helps us out. Um, I wanted to also remind everyone to take action for Klamath River Dam removal and to stop the Delta Tunnel. We will also be putting out some action alerts on stopping the Shasta Dam Rays, which would um, flood sacred sites and really hurt the salmon on the Sacramento River. Um, so please follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, because we are always putting out new action alerts. Um, and we also wanted to remind you about the week of action starting September 14th for California Water Justice. It's our next webinar series, but it will be focused on taking action as part of every webinar. And that's for clean water in the Central Valley, stopping water privatization in Southern California, Throughout the state, we are all struggling for clean air, a healthy climate, and clean water. Um, and I also wanted to remind everyone to please stay safe um, during COVID-19 and please make sure to wear a mask and protect each other. Um, 
and to take action whenever you can to support our rivers and support our youth. And as I said, this is the last of our webinar series, but we still have a symposium coming up at the end of September. So if you can present or if you want to present, please go um, to the link that I think we provided in the chat earlier, but you could also go to Save California Salmon's website or the Native American Studies page on Facebook um, and find out more about that um, Water Protector Symposium. Um, and and also you can find out more about the week of action for California water justice on our website and on our, all our social media pages. Um, so thank you so much for coming to the last three months of these webinars. Thank you to all of our youth that joined us here today. You are a real inspiration. Um, and thank you uh, again um, to Grant Gilkinson who gave his whole life to supporting people on the Klamath River and to supporting um, native people and to supporting um, youth activism. Um, we're gonna miss you Grant so much. Um, so yeah, please um, take care of the water, take care of the air and we will see you on the next webinar series. Thank you so much to everyone who's attended. Um, we really, really appreciate you.